Welcome to another Having a Book Moment with John Longke. We are lucky enough to be graced with the presence of R. Crumb in the warehouse once again, and he was uh, willing to answer a few questions to set the history books straight. Yeah. So, First I'm going to plug this book, The Frozen <laughs> Diaries, <laughs> illustrated by Janelle Hessig. It's a work of genius, kids. Pick it up. A hilariously funny, great read. Um, great book. Yeah? Okay. Um, well, see, I was going to ask you some about Weirdo Magazine, like how you started Weirdo, what were you going so for ago, when you started about it? <laughs> it was too long ago. It was 30 years ago. I can't remember that far back. <laughs> well, was it was it Peter Bag you started it with? Or? No, no. Oh, so it was just you yeah. in the beginning? The idea came to me in meditation. Yeah, Weirdo, because I was very discouraged about Zap comics. You know? Why were you discouraged about Zap? Those other artists, you know, like Wilson and Moscoso would say, yeah, we're like a band, man, we're like a rock band, you know, we work really well together, we can't let any art other artists in there, and I just kept wanting to open up to, you know, Justin Green, Kim Deitch, this one, now there's lots of good, and they just, no, 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 just us, Magnificent Seven, that's it. And so, because of consequence, since they were slow, especially Moscoso, that it would take years between issues, you know. So I thought, well, I'll just start another magazine. I'll just maintain the editorship. I'll be the boss, and I'll decide what goes in, and and, and uh, you know, I'll be take total editorial control myself, whatever I want, you know, whatever I want to use. And at first, I I decided I would use like a lot of crazy old shit and everything, you know. But then artists wanted to be in there, and I kept gradually over the first few issues, more and more, you know, current artists at the time were interested in submitting work and all that, so then it became really an editing job of dealing with all these artists, you know, which was uh, enjoyable for a while, but then, like, issue number <coughs> eight, seven or eight, I was really tired of that. It was a thankless job, and, <laughs> and, you know, there was no pay for the editorial chores, and, you know, coming down here, presenting the work to Ron for, you know, and get, had to stand over Ron, make sure he signed those checks, wrote <coughs> those checks for every artist, you know, and Ron would be sitting there poised with his pen and telling stories all day. And you know, <laughs> Ron said, we could write the checks, please, come on. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll send these checks out, don't worry about it. No, I'm going to send the checks out. I don't trust Ron to get those checks out to the people. You know, it's, <laughs> if we leave it up to Ron, it might take a while, you know. So. <laughs> They just stood over, made him write those checks, the big 50 bucks a page for every artist. Did you have a certain set of artists you wanted to work with in no. the very beginning? Or no. Did you just let In the beginning, I had no idea. I just wanted to make this wacky, wacko thing. Somehow I saw it sort of a combination of, of like punk zines and humbug. You know, it was kind of my idea, sort of combined the old 50s Kurtzman thing that, I, that was still inspiring me with this, all the new crazy shit that was going on graphically, you know, at that, that time. All the punk stuff, I was fascinated by all that stuff. Who were your favorite of, artists, actually, at the beginning of the Weirdo thing? I mean, which were the ones that first kind of spoke to you from that younger generation? Or? The younger generation? Well, Peter Bagg. Peter Bagg liked him. Liked J.D. King, liked his stuff. And then Dory Sita came along, and wow, I saw her first stuff. Wow, that's really strong, you know. So I put her in Weirdo. Eleanor Norfluss liked her. Nobody else liked her. <laughs> she was totally psycho. And I like that. She was so psycho. I said, what? What is this? What are you, why are you printing this? And of course, nobody liked those photo funnies that I did. I said, also another element of those 40s girly mags I wanted to put in there, those photo funnies. But well, there was that great strip too by like the homeless person who handed you some art on the bus or something like oh, that. that was the that frog was, or something like you know. that. Was, uh, what was that guy's name that did the frog strip? That black guy that I didn't meet him on the bus. Roger Brand met him on the bus and got that one page from him on the bus. And Roger Brand had that page. Oh. I said, "Wow, can I print this?" Yeah, sure. It was a great piece of outsider and, uh, art. Yeah. And apparently he used to, he did other stuff, but I was never able to find, he was gone, he died or something, and we couldn't find any of those other frog strips that he did. Remember that one? The frog strip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did this be tainty meat, taint your, taint mine. <laughs> Remember, how you rock, how you hammer. That was another one of the lines from it. And the last strip he's been taken away on a stretcher. Dead. <laughs> Shoots a bang. Did he? 
Peter Bag then started doing some of the editorial well, work. It's like I got so burned out on it by issue number seven or eight. And it was just so time because I'm mean, dealing with all these artists. Every artist is temperamental and fussy. And, uh, you know, he hasn't sent me back my work, and why aren't you using that? And, and I remember, like, actually making an editorial criticism of the strip that Spain did. It said, it's unclear what's happening in a couple of these panels here. Spain, you really got very bristly and indignant about that. <laughs> so, uh, Peter Bag was sending strips. I was, you know, kind of tight with him at that time. And I asked him if he wanted to take over the. I called him up, remember, saying, Peter, I. Would you be interested in taking over the editorial ship of Weirdo? And he said, Boy, would I! <laughs> I remember him saying that on the phone. Boy, oh boy, would I! <laughs> God, so, it's like Leave it to Beaver or something. Yeah, he was like, he was like a bright eyed, bushy tailed young, you know, hard working artist at that time. And uh, he put a lot of energy, put this you know, enthusiasm and energy into it first, you know, and then he burned out by it after about eight issues. He burned out. Because part of it was just there was just no money for all the time and work it took. <coughs> it didn't pay enough to make it worthwhile. Because Aileen kind of was one of the main well, editors then, later when, in the later issues. Bag said, I can't do it anymore. I want to do more. I just want to focus on my own work. And that was my problem, too. I just wanted to focus on my own work and dealing with all these crazy fucking artists. So then Aileen took it over <laughs> and with, uh, I don't know, issue number 17 or something like that. 18. We each had nine issues. That's right, yeah, we each did nine issues. That's right. There was 28 issues altogether. The last one we did in France. 27. Like issues. two years after we moved to France, we did number 28. Verdo. Yeah, Verdo. Right. So then Aileen took it over, and Aileen didn't bother her doing it because she was completely lackadaisical. She just let artwork pile up and letters pile up. She didn't answer the letter. She didn't respond. The artist said, Where's my artwork? You send back. The and like after it, we were folding, we were moving to France. And like, you know, packing up our stuff and it, in Aileen's office, I found this pile of artwork that she hadn't sent back to the artist. I said, oh my God, I gotta get this artwork back to the, to the artists before we move out of here. <laughs> I remember a couple times back in the 80s or 90s, artists would send last gas their collected works in like a huge envelope. Right. And sometimes there wouldn't be like a forwarding envelope or something. You're like, yeah, oh right. my God. It's right. Yeah. What a responsibility. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I remember someone like Ace Back or just something like that was very indignant that they angry Alina is starting to sue her. <laughs> what was the most difficult artist and all the stuff you've done, what was the most difficult or crazy out there artist you ever had to, you know, interact with or Oh boy, where do you begin? <laughs> Sita, Ace Backwards, Eleanor Norfluss. <laughs> Generally, a lot of artists were actually quite easy to work with. Peter Bag was very easy to work with, really very, you know, on top of his shit and, and very cooperative and, you know, helpful. There was other people like that, but some people were just, you know, crazy. It was difficult and crazy. But the original idea was, you know, much looser and crazier than later. It got just more and more about comics. Because that's what the kids mostly they wanted to see was comics. Nobody liked the photo funnies, you know, they didn't like weird arty stuff, you know. They just like comics, like stories, that's what they like. They still like tell them stories. A question about uh, uh, the, one of the artists. Uh, how did you actually originally hook up with Williams? I know that a lot of the Zap arts were from the Bay Area, but he was from LA. How did he come into the picture? Yeah, I remember exactly. I remember seeing his these pages by him in uh, I think it's one of those Big Daddy Roth magazines. Yeah, he was a, he's working for him. Uh, pages of these T-shirt designs he'd done, and then he'd done like this Will Elder type little funny, uh, you know, pseudo advertising things all around the T-shirts. That were great. It's great stuff. I don't remember if I contacted him or how that happened. But he got hooked up with Zap Crowd. Yeah, because I know he's from the, you know, he's from LA and the most, yeah. most of them. Everybody else met up in San Francisco, right? Well, I originally met Spain and New York. Oh, that's right, East Village Other, maybe? Yeah, East Village Other and hung out with and actually stayed with Spain and Kim in New York. And they had this slum apartment. The Puerto it's like Rican's, guys. Yeah. Puerto Ricans finally busted a hole in the wall and came through there and robbed them. 
they they they, they, they broke the wall, not the yeah, they, window or the they door. Made, and they no, just <laughs> they made a hole in the wall from the next apartment, which was like an abandoned apartment. And came in there and stole whatever was worth stealing. If they didn't have much of anything, but yeah, I worked on the East Village other with those guys. You know, at Wilson, I guess, in San Francisco, I guess. Yeah, he came to San Francisco in early 68, met him, and I met Griffin and Moscoso. They, they were kind of thinking about doing a comic book, Griffin and Moscoso, doing, after doing those psychedelic posters. This was in 67. And they saw Zap comics, and I think Moscoso, one of them, approached me about it, joining forces with a comic book. Oh, so he was the one who talked you into doing it as an anthology as opposed to a solo comic, I guess. Well, I don't know. I don't remember exactly. Maybe I invited them. I might have invited them to, to do it with me. Just, Let's do a comic together. Yeah, great. But then after Williams got into it and uh, Gilbert Shelton and Wilson and all of this, we had these seven artists. They wanted to become the establishment, close it off to anybody else. Which, and from that moment on, I got less and less interested in it. And then they just kept, it took them forever to do their work, like I said, especially Moscoso. So, that, was that the beginning of the tension that led up to the fist fight and zap whatever? Yes, it was. was. 15 or something like that. That's the beginning of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was started gradually simmering so the tension. Or finally, uh, at Terry's house, I forget when that was even, and they were going to, by that time, I already told them I don't want to do it anymore. And they just kept pushing me to, to do it again, do another Zap comic. Wilson and Spain and Moscoso. Gilbert didn't care. Robert Williams didn't care. Robert Williams accepted at some point that it was over. And then the, these other guys just kept pushing to do it again and again. Spain had this idea of, like, you know, we'll just go down fighting. They're not going to stop us. You know, we'll keep Zap comics going to the very end. You know, he saw this battle against, you know, the, the fascist propaganda media machine, you know. It was fine, great, but, you know, I just didn't, it was not, you know, a, a viable, workable thing being confined to just those seven artists. So, for the, la the last couple of years, it was like five years apart, I think it was even ten years ten. apart at some point. <laughs> That's ridiculous, come on. Do you think that now that the anthology's done, it's kind of laid to rest, or is that yes, going to that's, be, it's you think over. that's going to be the end of it? <laughs> that's the end of it. Yeah. Okay. It's over. I mean, what did you think about the anthology? I mean, it, it had always been this kind of pop culture, cheap comic book, and then it came out as this super yeah. deluxe art edition. Yeah. What did you $500 think? $500 for a set of Zap comics. It's ridiculous. I don't know. I mean, it's, I guess... I mean, how do you? It's that inevitable. That's so almost like it, that's actually the official. You've crossed over from underground to like to mainstream art, or, or even to something the establishment elite. art, or something. Yeah, the elite something art. Elite, yeah. Which is like completely against my original idea is to do a, a comic book as cheap as possible. You know? I wanted to do it for ten cents. Everybody said, "No, you can't do it for ten cents." <laughs> so, okay, twenty-five cents. All right, you can do it for twenty-five cents. Oh, now it's got to go up to fifty cents. Oh, now it's got to go up to five ninety-five. <laughs> that was actually I had problems with that too because I always felt like Zap was everywhere and it was this cheap thing that anybody could buy. And then when the anthology came out, it was this very deluxe. You had yeah. to be a super collector to get it. And I that was a. I, don't, I, I think they only printed like twenty-five hundred copies or something like that. Thousand. Right? Ply Mills was a thousand. Ply yeah. Mills was a thousand, but then yeah, we printed then that was five thousand. 5,000, the first point mill edition. Yeah. It's 5,000. Uh, what was your reaction when you met Plymel and Donahue? Do you recall? Donahue said he met you at a party. Yeah, well, you know, I had, I had originally turned out this two complete issues of Zap Comics for that guy Brian Zahn in Philadelphia who had done Yarrow Stocks. And then I gave Brian Zahn the original artwork for Zap number which was supposed to be number one, which ended up being number zero. And I never heard from him again. And I, I kept calling up the office in Philadelphia, and they said, oh, Brian Zahn went to India. He went to India to seek enlightenment or some bullshit. Did the original artwork ever surface? It did, yeah. Ten years later, Albert Morris managed to get it back immediately from Brian Zahn just by sending him a nasty, threatening letter. The artwork arrived immediately. 
and then Brian Zahn was all outraged and indignant that I complained about him in some article or something. I thought that he was really feelings were hurt. <laughs> and then the artwork went into a safe deposit box, and that's the last time I ever saw it. <laughs> Dana got it, sold it. <laughs> he done. So, what you, so originally, then you hooked up. You came to San Francisco, and that's where you hooked up with Plymouth and Donahue. Yeah. So Brian Zahn copped out. And then I, so I had the artwork for the second issue of Zap, and I knew this woman, um, Marilyn, what's her name? Marilyn Jones. Somehow I met her in San Francisco, and she knew Don. You invited him over. Don, you saw the artwork, said, Wow, this is great. I want to print this. And he didn't have a press, he had nothing. <laughs> did he, somebody had a ditto machine or something like that, wasn't it? Or like that? No, it was a multi lift 1250, that's what Plymel had. AB Dick. AB Dick. Yeah. Like a Maybe small, a graph machine. No, no, it was a small offset press. Oh, okay. About as big as that piano over there. And, you know, you kind of had to hand feed it and stuff. I don't know. Small. It was a very popular, you know, offset press for small operations. Well, I know I got that press from Ginsburg. Ginsburg had an art grant and got that press and gave it to Plymel. Oh. Allen Ginsburg? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Plymel was part of the beatnik scene. He was a little bit older That's than right. us. He was a poet. He's still around, I think. Still back still in the Kick spoke to a yes. collection of his, yeah. And I was printing off these wacko beatnik publications off his multi lith I remember he had these issues of Click from the late 30s. He was just cutting stuff out of them, making these wacky photo collage paper magazines and stuff. So Donahue knew him, and somehow he had his press set up at. The Lowry Opera House? Might have been. Was it Don, Don, you ended up there after yeah. you got the press, but the press originally was at 2180 Bryant. Oh, it was? Oh, yeah. Bryant Street. That's, that's, where, it was first, that's where it was first. That's where Plymel was? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't remember that. So, yeah, Plymel ran off the first printing of Zap Comics, and then in, I guess it was in uh, late 67, early 68, something yeah. like that. Uh, and then Donnie bought the press. And, and then, then Plymouth got tired of the whole thing, yeah, and I think he even left, went back to Kansas or wherever, Wichita or whatever. And Wasn't and that just like hitting the summer of love and the hate or something like that? It was after that. Okay. So the next year was 68. Okay. And uh, Donnie then decided he would learn how to use that press. Donnie had never operated a press before and know what the fuck he was doing. I remember going over there once. He was running off Snatch Comics or something, and Don, he's standing there holding a, a bottle of whiskey in his hand, and he's watching the press as the pages are just coming out of the of the end of the press and just falling in a big pile on the floor, a big random pile. And he's just standing there watching. I said, "What's going on here?" He said, "Well, it's better to let them fall in a pile like that that lets the ink dry than a, than a stack them later." <laughs> So it took him forever, it took him a long time to print things. So as the comics were picking up and momentum and people, stores and all were starting to want them, he was just too damn slow. So then uh, Don Schenker from the print mint came up. Somehow he came into it and volunteered to take up like a much more like business-like printing operation of, of underground comics. And we welcomed that great. Great, because Donahue, he just couldn't keep up with it. it was, he was just, you know, so too small of an operation. You know? well, the, the head shops were starting to buy him in big numbers by that point, all the kind of hippie shops. Starting to, yeah. About. At first, they looked, I remember when we first took Zap Comics around to the head shops on Haight Street, they just looked at comic book. We don't sell comic books here. Cause it just Zap number one looked like a comic book, you know. It just kind of looked like a straight comic book to them. They flipped their what is this comic book? It took maybe a few months, I don't know, not long, six months before. Well, <coughs> in 67, Printman had a shop on Haight Street. Yeah. They were selling posters. Yeah, it was a wall's car with post those dance posters, yeah. So I, and so I think that's when that, you know, Shankers owned that. Did he, he owned that? Alice. Yeah, I wasn't sure what the deal and was there. The, the Ritas had come up from the valley where they were working, the farm workers, and became employees at uh, he was in, 
Rita came up, it was about the lettuce strikers. And yes. The farm workers had a big strike, and Rita came to Berkeley to promote the strike and the, you know, and the Berkeley scene and all that, and work with the, uh, you know, the left-wing parties in Berkeley for that strike. And he needed a job, and him and Peggy, Rita, the, the Schenker hired them to work there. And then Schenker bowed out of the whole thing. He couldn't have it. He was a nervous wreck. <laughs> Don Schenker. Yeah, we're and so then Bob and Peggy Reedus took over the business. Well, they had, they kept the, uh, Schenker's kept the frame shop on Telegraph. And the Reedus oh, ended up with the warehouse. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Poster stuff. That's right. Very mm -hmm. nice. That was great. Well, that's history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's history with art. It's ancient. Yeah, exactly. down it's ancient at this time. So. At this point, Jesus. Mesmerizing walk down memory lane. Right. Well, mesmerizing stumble down memory well, lane. Well, at, <laughs> at least you get to write it instead of somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, it's right. been written. It's all been written. Right. Clay Geardies and the big debates about, you know, what, what, what happened thinking? first. The legendary baby carriage, you know, selling Zach Collins of a baby, baby carriage. Well, I remember there's all this like ad nauseum interviews. Is that true or false? That's true. We did that a couple of times because Dana was pregnant with Jesse and you know we had this baby carriage. And then somebody wait, like, say, so was was the baby in the carriage with the comics? Was no, Jesse he wasn't. in the baby? <laughs> you were selling them, you know. No. Okay. He was swaddled in issues of Zap or something. Like that. I don't think he was. Maybe he was. I don't remember. I don't think so.